If you've watched my videos in the past on how to listen to classical music, you'll know about the sonata, basically a multi-movement work by a composer which explores several different moods or keys. It normally starts with a first movement in sonata form. There's a video on that too, check the description. Then there might be a slow movement. Then possibly a dance movement or scherzo, a sort of jokey movement. And then a grand finale, which could be a rondo or sonata form or something else. If you want to learn more about that, then check out the linked video where I talk about that in more detail. But this video is about concertos. A concerto is essentially a sonata for solo instrument or solo instruments and orchestra. So you might have a piano concerto, or a violin concerto, or a cello concerto. Or you could also have a double concerto, or a triple concerto, where there are more than one soloist. But there's a problem. We now have this issue of the individual versus the crowd. The lone voice versus the masses. The one versus the many. There is this antithesis between soloist and orchestra, and a really good concerto will explore this antithesis, this contrast of forces, with all kinds of nuance, delicacy, and expressive thought. So the problem is, how can we take this opposition of forces and make it balanced and expressive? Because the key to the concerto is, it's not all about virtuosity and showing off. It's all about balance. So I'm going to take you through a quick history of this form and how composers dealt with this problem, leading to what we now know as the concerto form. Let's look at the great composer George Frederick Handel. Here's the first aria from his famous oratorio, Messiah. It's a joyful melody, but part of its vitality comes from the contrast between voice and accompaniment. First, we have an orchestral opening, where the full orchestra can show their colours. Then the soloist comes in, and the orchestra drops out of the scene to let the soloist show his colours without distraction. Everybody. The orchestra then imitates the singer. And the singer continues with just a very light accompaniment from the orchestra. Everybody. When the singer drops out again, the band might take over for a moment, but it always drops away again to let the singer through. So you see, Handel is very careful about when to let the orchestra shine alone, when to let the soloist shine alone, and when and to what extent to combine them. Well, that's all fine. The singer obviously stands out from the orchestra, but things are perhaps a bit harder with an instrument. The solo instrument still needs to be able to stand out from the orchestra as a living personality, but their tones risk blending. For example, a solo cello might risk blending with the rest of the orchestra. How do we balance these two elements, these unequal forces? How do we make sure that both orchestra and soloist give their best effect, and one doesn't merely fall subservient to the other? Ideally, we want the soloist and the orchestra to be in a well-balanced dialogue with each other. What's a good solution? Well, here's one. Let the orchestra start with a statement of the musical material, the main themes. Then, after this, let the soloist come in with a counterstatement of that same material. This way, we can really feel the force of the soloist as it thrusts the orchestra into the background. And at the same time, the orchestra has had its say, and it won't seem unnaturally repressed. Then, later on, at the end of the movement, the orchestra will return in full, after the solo has reached its climax. The soloist will be more active, more personal, and perhaps more eloquent, and so it can make a brilliant climax if it chooses. But it can't make itself very powerful in sound, at least not compared to a full orchestra. Whereas the orchestra can make a sonic climax with ease, so that best come last, after the soloist's climax. And so, for these reasons, a purely orchestral introduction and a purely orchestral ending is often used in concertos.
In earlier music, we call these framing orchestral tutti sections the ritornello. Ritornello is based on the Italian word for return. So it's kind of like the chorus of a song, which we keep returning to, and these are separated by interludes for the soloist. So in the Handel aria that we listen to, the first 20 seconds of the piece are called the ritornello. It's for orchestra only. And the last 20 seconds too, once the soloist finishes his climax, are the same ritornello. But that's an aria, not a concerto. So let's look at a concerto now. Listen to Vivaldi's Spring Concerto. Here is the famous ritornello for full orchestra, where we are introduced to the main tune. Then later, a solo group takes over. In this case, they're imitating birdsong. This movement then goes through several sections for soloists only, in several different keys. Well, how do we balance these solo sections with the orchestra? The answer is, Vivaldi brings back the ritornello, or orchestral chorus, several times. He's had the ritornello in full at the beginning, and almost full length at the very end. But in the middle, in between these solo sections, we get several shorter versions of the ritornello, sometimes varied or altered, maybe in different keys, and sometimes just a few bars long. We don't get to hear the fuller ritornello back in the home key until the very end of the movement. So go have a listen to the first movement of Vivaldi's Spring Concerto, and count how many times you can hear the ritornello. I counted six. For another early example, we can think of Johann Sebastian Bach and his Brandenburg concertos. This is called a concerto grosso, or a thick concerto. So here, the opposition is between the full orchestra and as many solo players as it takes to create a mass of harmony. In the case of, say, the third Brandenburg concerto, all players play together for the ritornellos and then split into whatever groups they please for the solo sections. In this concerto, Bach uses nine different combinations of solo groups for his various solo sections. But the principle is much the same. Full orchestral ritornello, then soloist passages, alternating with fragments of the ritornellos, moving through different keys until a final soloist climax, and then a final orchestral ritornello. And the mastery of form comes out in the delicacy of balance between these sections. So that's a summary of earlier concerto style, but things changed in the classical era, and one of the big game changers was the development of a fully fledged sonata form. So the typical concerto from Mozart's day onwards has three movements, a dramatic first movement, a slow middle movement, and a faster finale. And the first movement was almost always in a kind of concerto sonata form. I've made a video on normal sonata form, which I highly recommend you watch if you're new to this stuff. But sonata form is based on a special kind of conflict and resolution. The conflict and resolution of different keys, of different moods and themes. Whereas in Bach's time, a short orchestral ritornello would be enough to sum up the main theme of the movement, and the soloist didn't have to introduce any fresh material if the composer didn't feel like it, with sonata form, it's not so simple anymore. With sonata form, if you're going to use a ritornello, it should be larger and contain more than one idea, so the orchestra will play a more important part than ever. Yet. As this is about balance, this means that the soloist, too, will need to be more brilliant than ever if it is to stand out against the orchestra. Remember, too, that the size of the orchestra had increased, adding woodwinds and brass and so on. And this, too, meant that the soloist needed to do more in order to stand out in contrast. So, more than ever, the entry of the soloist had to instantly arrest attention, and by the force of its individuality, it would thrust even the most elaborate orchestra into the background. <laughs> 
Yet, the more expansive the piece, the greater the range of themes, and so the longer this soloist's first entrance might be delayed in order to heighten that moment of entry. So, enough background, let's just say what the sonata form concerto looks like, at least in textbook form. First, the orchestra will give its ritonello. In this ritonello, the orchestra will give out the first and second subject of the exposition, but this will all remain in one key, instead of being in two contrasting keys. Then, the soloist appears, hopefully in a musically compelling way, and it will restate both these subjects, now somewhat more at leisure and in contrasting keys. After this, there will be an orchestral tutti in the new key, probably based on the themes we've already heard. This ends the exposition. From here, the soloist will work out a typical sonata development and recapitulation, just as you would expect in sonata form. As ever, a good composer will continue to think about balance and sharing material between soloist and orchestra. Finally, at the end of the recapitulation, there will be an orchestral tutti interrupted by a cadenza. The cadenza is a moment where the soloist has free reign, a virtuoso extended passage where she can go completely wild, virtuosic, and have an extended period to play out completely unaccompanied. In Mozart's day, cadenzas were almost always improvised by the performers. Nowadays they tend to be written out, but they remain an opportunity for virtuosic brilliance and to really show off the performer's skill and musicality. Cadenzas often develop the themes of the movement even further, too. Finally, once the cadenza ends, the orchestra plays us out with one final tutti. As for the other movements of a concerto, there's normally a slow middle movement and a faster finale. These tend to be much simpler in form. The soloist has already been introduced in the first movement, and so we don't need to put so much weight on how they enter in the next movements. So these movements tend to be in sectional forms like ABA or ABACA. Mozart in his last movements would make good use of the rondo. He would give the main theme to the orchestra with lots of accessories. Then, when the main theme returned later, they would not have their accessories until the very end where they share these accessories with the soloist and orchestra and soloist round off the movements together. I should say there is some irony to everything that I've just said. I've just outlined a textbook form for the concerto. However, very few of the great concertos actually fully follow this form, at least not to a T. As with many formal structures in art, the greatest works tend to use those models as guides, but then break the rules. For example, in some of Beethoven's great piano concertos, the piano begins the work completely solo. Only after an introductory solo passage does the orchestra then come in with its first ritonello, and the form then continues as it's supposed to. In other works, there is no ritonello at all. Take Mendelssohn's Violin Concerto, Elgar's Cello Concerto, Sibelius's Violin Concerto, and so on. There are probably too many to list, but these still follow sonata form principles and still make an exquisite balance between orchestra and soloist, even if there is no traditional ritonello. I hope now you can take what you've learned from this video and deepen your appreciation of the concerto form and how certain composers mastered that balance between soloist and orchestra. By the way, I've made a playlist of what I think are essential concertos on Prime Phonic. I think I've been pretty thorough with Mozart, Beethoven and the classical period, all the way onwards through the Romantic period and right the way through to the 20th century. So there's plenty of amazing recordings for you to explore there. You don't have to listen to the whole thing, but it might give you a little more to listen to and explore. So check that out on Prime Phonic. You can get two months absolutely free if you use my code. The details are in the description below, so check that out. Thank you for watching and I'll see you soon.